Thanks for joining us today on Uptime Logistics. Of course, it's powered by Cap Logistics. I'm your host, Doug Draper with the Denver Transportation Club. And we have a, a, an awesome guest today. We're gonna be speaking with uh, Fernando Noriega. He's with BTS Group Incorporated. Uh, Fernando, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Doug. Thanks for inviting me. Really happy to be here. I appreciate Excellent. it. Yeah, Fernando and I were talking uh, a week or so ago about what the heck are we going to talk about, and uh, he made a comment that I thought was an awesome, awesome title. So we're really going to, um, so the official title is Uncovering the Mystery of Customs Clearances uh, and Border Crossings uh, into and out of Mexico. So we're going to unravel the mystery and uh, and have a good conversation. So look forward Sounds to great. it. Sounds great. One, yeah. One thing we like to do um, before we get into the topic is learn a little bit about our guest, right? So, Fernando, just kind of give us an update, kind of how you got into this crazy industry and maybe a little <laughs> bit about, about your businesses and some of the uh, services that you provide. Sure, sure. Uh, well, uh, currently, as, as you mentioned, I am the president of BTS Group. Um, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Texas of San Antonio. I earned my degree, uh, my BBA, the Bachelor in Business Administration with a major in Information Systems. And then after that, I did a master's degree from Texas A&M International, also in Information Systems. So I guess I'm setting the pattern there a little bit, which we'll get into in a while. And I've been working full time for with in, in BTS for over 23 years already. And uh, I say full time because I've actually been working in the company since I'm nine years old. Um, it's a family owned, it's a family privately owned business, BTS Group. And my father started by my father over, I guess, 40 years ago. And now it's my brother, myself, and, and my father who operate and, and, and run the business. So it's been, it's been quite a bit that we've been involved in the business. And B BTS Group is a, is a company specialized in, in, in certain activities, as you mentioned right now, in freight forwarding, warehousing, distribution, Mexican customs, prep, documentation preparation, quite a bit of a spe specialized activities that, that we do. And we are headquartered in Laredo, Texas, with presence in El Paso, Texas, and Nogales, Arizona as well. We have over 375,000 square feet and uh, 15 acres of trailer yard space. So that is basically where we, where we run our operation. So as far as infrastructure is concerned, uh, pretty much set up in, in those ports. So that's what we've been doing lately. <laughs> nice. All right. So I have to ask the question, if you started at nine years old, what the heck did you do when you were nine years old for the business? Well, my father was very he wanted us to know the business from the ground up. And I think that that was a huge when you now, now that I am older now and that's worked full time in the company, you come to understand why it was so important from understanding the very beginning of the process and getting to know every single activity, how it's done and how it should be done. It allows you to understand fully what you want to do and how you want to do it. How, how, as time passes, you begin to understand clients' needs and, and, and you, you, you put the whole puzzle together and, and it's helped a lot. So we, were, we started from receiving trailers outside and uh, sweeping warehouse floors and then doing audits in the warehouse and then gradually worked our way up to where we are now. So it's That's been great. a fun, very fun ride. Nice. Yeah, some of the tribal knowledge, you know, that's difficult to, uh, you know, all of the education in four walls at a university, um, there's still that tribal knowledge that kind of sets you apart for your competition. So it certainly sounds like uh, you have plenty of that. Yes. So awesome. Well, let's just kind of get into the, the meat and the potatoes, right? This is kind of a, a question that could go on forever. But, uh, you know, the whole purpose is to uh, unravel the mysteries on there. So maybe we could talk a little bit about what actually happens um, during uh, the, the border crossing, you know, and, and maybe you just kind of take it step by step. I'm a very kind of visual, basic person from the Midwest. So maybe we could just say here's step one, step two, step three, and just kind of follow through, you know, maybe the um, systemic, the documentation management, but, but then also like, where is the freight? Like physically, where is the freight along that process? So maybe you could walk us through that a little bit. Sure, I'll be glad to. Um, like you mentioned, the, just in itself, the title itself, uh, clearing border, clearing the border in regards to any shipment being north or southbound, obviously creates 
quite a bit of stress and tension sometimes for importers or exporters. And but when you when we get through it and we'll run through it a little bit here, and you'll figure, you'll notice that it's not something to be afraid of. And uh, I guess I, we can start by walking, like you mentioned, through the process. And border the border clearance process is twofold. You can have southbound and or northbound operations. And I mentioned and I bring the difference up because there are different activities that happen either going southbound or perhaps going northbound. Uh, when we, re we refer to a southbound shipment as one that is coming from the U.S. and heading into Mexico, while a northbound shipment is one coming from Mexico heading into the U.S. And each one has its per particular, each type of operation has its own like set of activities and key players that are involved. Um, and I guess we can start with the southbound. Like I mentioned, a, a shipment, let's pretend that we have a shipment going from the U.S. into Mexico. And they keep, before we go into where physically or, with, or, or go through the steps there, the, the main players for a southbound shipment, there, you have obviously everything starts with a supplier. The supplier, the one who's actually selling a certain good or a certain product to a, an importer into Mexico. There's a supplier. You have obviously a transportation company who is in charge of moving the freight from the supplier to the border or even perhaps beyond. But and then you have also a freight forwarder, which is an example like BTS Group, which is we'll get into what they, the certain activities that they do. You have that. And uh, then after that, I would say that the next player involved is a drainage company who is actually the one in charge of just doing the border crossing. And then you have the Mexican Customs the Mexican customs uh, broker who is a counterpart of the freight forwarder. And finally, you have the importer of record in Mexico. So those are the, the, the major players that are involved in, in a southbound process there. And if, if we were to visualize it, and I guess we can visualize it more fully walking through an example, like you say, and, and perhaps we can use something that's happening right now. Uh, let's say with the situation that we're living we want to maybe you have a company, let's say in Guadalajara, Guadalajara, who is uh, maybe cutting and sewing face masks for uh, medical personnel or for our front line that you want to bring back into the U.S. Mm -hmm. So you have, let's say there's a supplier that's selling rolls of cloth, uncl uh, uncut or unsewn cloth that is, needs to go to Mexico. That's where the first player comes in, the supplier. So it has the rolls of cloth. It sells. It sells that. It hires a transportation company. Well, maybe perhaps it touches uh, the door for, for cap logistics, and it gets on the phone with them to be able to move the shipment from the supplier to the to the border. So that transportation gets those rolls of cloth to the border. And when I say the border, that's where it reaches the freight forwarder. In this case, for example, would be BTS Group. What happens there? There's, there's quite a bit of activities that, that the freight forwarder carries out. First of all, we have the, the, there's a trailer reception in your yard. Uh, if it's, F, let's say it's a full trailer load or known as an FTL, you receive that trailer. You, may, you, have to, you have to verify it, audit the material to make sure that what is being invoiced by the supplier is what is actually on the trailer because that is what you're going to document onto Mexican Customs. You may have to transload or a certain shipment from one trailer to another. You may have to consolidate with other goods. Perhaps uh, maybe that same supplier sent uh, via LTL in a smaller size shipment. They sent maybe the strings that will be sewn onto the, the actual cloth there for the face mask. So you might consolidate. And all these activities happen at the border. And obviously, you document, you have to clap mix, you have to determine the Mexican HTS classification for the goods as well. And then you finally document that, that shipment in order to be able to cross the, the, the border. Gotcha. So all those activities happen at the freight border in Laredo before even heading toward the border. Gotcha. That's great. I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but you answered uh, a, a good question is like, where does all that happen? It sounds like it's still on the U.S. side. Correct. Right. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. One hundred percent correct. And yes, sometimes that ha that creates a little bit of confusion. But yes, all of this happens at on a, talking about a cell phone shipment. Yes, the, the answer is on the U.S. side, Got on it. the U.S. side of the border. Previous to crossing, we must keep in mind that that Mexican customs is pretty strict, and and there's quite a bit of fines and penalties if you have 
overages of, of, of uh, a certain product that is not declared on the invoice or even shortages, or you, which can create huge problems. And we'll get into that a little bit further down. But um, so that's why it's very important to, to have the, these, these activities being done at, at, before you cross at the border in order to be able to ensure that your, your shipment runs smoothly. Got it. So it gets transloaded. Um, you're on the U.S. border. Is it then put into a, um, uh, a Mexican uh, trailer at that point? Or does the, does the U.S. carrier still then bring it across the physical border? It can be both. We, it, it can be both. Depending on, on, on the terms, uh, it, we have both cases. Sometimes there are direct shipments that are loaded from the supplier and that same trailer goes all the way into Mexico to the final destination. Sometimes it stops at the border, gets transloaded onto a Mexican trailer, and then hauled from there, cross the border, and go into Mexico. It depends. It can go both. Gotcha. Yes. And when do the actual duties and taxes paid? So you assign the HDS code is 1234, and there's a 5% duty rate. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, paid and captured uh, prior before it moves into Mexico? Or are yes. there terms that are provided to... Uh, the, yes. uh, the importer of record. Talk about that. Yes, yes, that's a great question because it, it does differ a little bit from the US, from U.S. customs. In, for Mexican customs, you do have to pay all, all all your all your duties before before crossing the border. That is something that is very particular for or peculiar of, of, of for Mexican customs. But that all happens before. So all your paperwork is already done and paid for before heading into into the actual customs for dispatch. Gotcha. Yeah. And what if what if there's some confusion or discrepancy, right? So let's say that it's not you. The the um, uh, supplier thinks it's HTS code one two three. The Mexican government says no, it's seven eight nine, and the duty rate isn't five percent; it's ten percent. So when there's that um, issue at the border with, with with duties and taxes, is that all resolved prior? And and how does that get resolved? Well, actually, when 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 the shipment is ready, when you have all the paperwork filed and, and documented, and you had all the you paid all the duties and everything, that's when the other player comes into the, the drayage company, which actually takes the trailer from our facility and just does the border crossing. It is in that border crossing that it has to go through Mexican customs, and Mexican customs either has you have either a green light or a red light, meaning if you're green lighted, that trailer does not even have to go through. Customs does not even have to give a second look at it. If it's red lighted, that means that you do have to stop for inspection. And that's where Mexican customs will go over all your paperwork. And that's where there, there can be a discrepancy. They can say, hey, the cloth shouldn't be one, two, three, four, uh, or it's an eight digit number, an H, eight digit HTS code for Mexico. They can say, no, we don't agree with that one. It should be nine, eight, seven, six. And that's where the the other player that I mentioned before, the Mexican customs broker, that is where you have per, uh, dedicated personnel at the actual border uh, doing all that work with, with Mexican customs and saying, hey, no, well, this is this type of cloth and we, we classified it under this HTS code because of this specifications, et cetera. And that's where that gets resolved. And then once that is resolved, they release it and then it heads on to its final destination. Right. So having an advocate at the border, so to speak, is, is paramount to make sure things uh, move, move quickly. Yes. So that, let's talk about timing. All the things that we just walked through, um, just to keep it simple, let's say that the truck arrives in Laredo on a Monday. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I know the answer could be, it depends. <laughs> right. <laughs> but let, let's, let's say things are, are working smoothly and, and all the, the paper flow works. Um, we arrive on a Monday. When is that through customs and heading on to uh, to the factory? Well, uh, you yes, can't say it. You can't say I, it depends. I can't say it depends. So <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and say I'll, I'll, I can go ahead and answer it that. Assuming that everything is that we have all the paper, everything has been set up correctly, and that we have all the, the correct paperwork and everything, um, I would say that it's a matter of hours. It's a matter of hours where you can actually go ahead and cross that shipment. Obviously, you do have the famous defense, but it depends. Well, did you have the correct paperwork? Did you have to classify everything? Was the Mexican import of record not set up? Or was there any issues in the payment um, of duties, et cetera? But if everything, assuming everything is, is, is ready, 
and, and before it, it's just a matter we 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 have shipments or clients that actually um i can tell you that it's a matter of minutes not even hours because you are able to pre-document it all depends on the on the regimen uh, of the shipment there's definitive there's temporary there's fiscal uh, deposit shipments it depends but uh some of them more complex than, than others but uh, you, you can go as even as to as far as minutes and be able to have just all the paperwork ready and actually just waiting for the shipment to arrive and uh but it's a lot of things that have to happen before that obviously right yeah, yeah. like anything else in life right if you're prepared uh things will be a little bit easier so that that's a lot to be frank with you that's a lot faster than i would have thought if you said a day or two i'd have been like okay that seems about right so yeah um preparation will definitely expedite the process there yes yes for sure for sure and you obviously have certain shipments that do take several days it depends on what activities it depends on the type of shipment you may have um uh, uh, a complete oil rig or drill that you want it's going to be shipped from a certain place in Texas into Mexico and there are a hundred shipments and that you might have to wait for a couple of shipments all of them to come in and then cross at the same time you might have to check model numbers serial numbers for certain machineries so that's where it sometimes you have or you might have to wait for another LTL shipment that you want to also load on an FTL so that's where it takes maybe a day or two to until you wait. But if everything is prepared, it's pretty quickly. And that's why, even though it sounds scary, border clearance, it's actually, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Right. You, you brought up a good, um, a, a good point that I had a question on. So let's say that shipment is a full truckload. And then there's five extra pallets that are chasing it, right? So the full truckload arrives on a Monday, but the LTL shipment's not going to hit until Tuesday. Um, it's one commercial invoice for both, um, both shipments. Do you need to wait for the LTL shipment to catch up to it? Or are they going to let the full truckload through prior? Tell me about split shipments. Well, it, uh, it, if it's, it all depends on, on in, in the H, the, me- the determination of the Mexican HTS code. If, if those LTL shipments form part of, of the, of what is on the FTL shipment, then yes, you can go ahead and even send it before. But um, you have to obviously document it under a certain regimen with certain uh, uh, type of paperwork, if you will, or certain codes uh, that allow you to that and uh, that allow you to do that. But yes, uh, you and sometimes no, sometimes it has to go on the same shipment. So it, it really, it really is a case by case, and that's where everything where that's where a company like, like, like ourselves comes in where we, we actually take the supplier by the hand and say, Hey, what are we going to do? What, what is coming? And this is before it even reaches the border, which is a huge common mistake uh, for many of the shipper people shipping or trying to import stuff into Mexico. If it gets to the border and you haven't discussed that you're a little, you're running late and anything that you can do prior to that. And that's where we come in the, the expertise that we've had, to say, hey, let me understand your project. What are you going to ship? How are you going to ship it? Are they going to be flatbeds? Are they going to be FTLs? Or is there anything LTL that we're going to do? Is it considered one single HTS code for the entire shipments? Or is it the different HTS codes involved? There's quite a bit of, of activity that, that, that comes into play. And, and obviously, that's where we want to take over and, and let the supplier, and, but at the same time, the importer of record feel feel they don't have to stress about it. That's what we're here for. We're here to, to be able to make their lives easier in, in that regard. And, and, and it's obviously complying. It's a huge compliance, keeping compliance uh, at first hand and everything. And that's what we want to do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One thing we spoke about was the different modes going into Mexico um, rail and ground, right? And, and we focus primarily on the, on the trucking aspect of it. But mm-hmm. you brought up a, a good point uh, when we were chatting earlier that, you know, there's a lot of rail crossing. There's a lot of business that, move, that moves southbound, um, yes. you know, on rail. Talk a little bit about the differences with that and, and how the examples you just gave would be a little bit different in uh, the rail uh, sure, mode. sure, sure. Uh, yes, like you mentioned, I, I agree. There's quite a bit of rail operation being uh, carried out southbound, but northbound as well. It, uh, there's quite a bit coming out of Mexico and rail as well. Um, but the process is basically the same. The, the, the major difference, I would say, is that the, the rail 
the train doesn't stop at the border as would an FTL or an LTL shipment would stop at our facility and, and, and unload or be able to audit and make sure that everything is correct. That's the major difference between the two types of modes. Um, another difference is that you can obviously, it depends on the type of product that you want to handle. You can load more, more product onto rail shipments than you can into a 50 foot, 53 foot trailer. So that's another difference as well. Um, it gives you a little bit of flexibility. You can load onto containers by themselves. You can load piggyback style, which are, which are basically FTL uh, type trailers that are on a rail. Uh, gives you the ability to arrive at, at the border, unload perhaps the container, load onto a chassis, and then move from via ground from the border into Mexico. There's, that's another option. You can go through rail 100% from, from beginning to end. Or you can also, it allows you to also be able to stop at the border, unload and load onto trailers to be able to move. And for that, we, we have something that is known as a rail spur in, within our infrastructure where, where the train can actually arrive or, or the containers arrive. We unload, let's say, for example, you may have um, 40 huge rolls of craft paper and you wouldn't be able to load four, 40 rolls onto a 50 foot 53 foot trailer. So they send one huge uh, container with 40 rolls or it arrives at our rail spur. We unload that and we load onto maybe four or five trailers. And then from there, it moves on to Mexico. Obviously there, there's benefits there in regards to costs. There's the rail, rail cost uh, as far as transportation is a little bit cheaper so that they can take advantage of that. So it just gives you flexibility. Right. There's also some challenges with it that comes with it. Time, timing, timing. You have to be there's less there's less jiggle room there as far as rail. The rail companies give you 24 hours to be able to file all paperwork or not demerge. Charges come into play, so you have that. You also have the fact that at the end of the whole process, uh, maybe the destination, they do not have their own rail spur, so they have to arrive in Mexico at a public rail spur and then move from there to the plant, et cetera. So that might present some challenges as well, but there are benefits, there are some challenges. It depends what you want to move, what type of, of product commodity you want to move, how much it weighs, volume comes into play, and timing, timing. Uh, many, for example, automotive companies, it's just in, the inventory is on wheels. It's literally on wheels. So it's, there's really not that you don't have that much time. So, right. Right. That's the that, that, yeah, for sure. So, um, let's talk about the additional handling and sign of how those, how those charges work. So for example, um, uh, something needs to be transloaded. So you, you have a, a broker you work with and they say, just for easy math, it's a thousand dollars. Um, but it needs to be transloaded at the border for some reason, or even it gets to a public rail, uh, rail spur in say Mexico city. And there's an extra $300 to do that, or there's an extra 200 bucks to do that. Is, is that, uh, would the broker know that that thousand dollars would include all those potential additional touches or would it be like, Hey, here's the transportation from A to B, but the additional handling is 300 bucks. And those would be charges on top of things. How does a consumer budget that knowing that there may be other touch points? Is that blended into the transportation rate or would it be kind of ad hoc, um, a la carte type of, of fees? Yeah, well, it, it can actually go both ways. Uh, and for some clients, they do call you and say, hey, uh, I want it turnkey. How could we get it from the supplier all the way to the plant? And they don't want to worry about either transportation or rail or land. Or, or freight forwarder fees or broker fees. They just say, hey, put the product here. That's what we need. Some of them say, hey, we have a corporate contract with such, such and such company, a rail company or, or, trans, or ground company. And all I need to, for you guys to do is the freight forwarding in the Mexican brokerage. So I say, okay, fine. And for that, there's this and this fee. There's this fee for all the activities done on the US side. And there's this fee for the Mexican broker activities. And that gets, they obviously add that up. So it really depends. It's really, it's really about keeping the client happy. What, what do you need? And understanding how, what do you need? How do you need it? We, we have all the infrastructure. We have the know-how. We, we, we partnered up with great people, um, transportation companies, broker, the brokerage, Mexican brokerage, U.S. brokerage. So 
everything is basically there. Now it's just a matter of understanding, hey, what do you need up to what level of service do you require? And that's where we can go. You can bundle everything up or you can do it like you say a la carte. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. As we're talking through all this, um, having a good partner like yourself to really understand the nuances. You know, there's so many uh, companies out there that say, hey, it's moving from Denver, Colorado to Miami, Florida, and they may, ch- you know, quote five different companies and find the cheapest rate. Um, yeah. That doesn't really, it sounds like that really wouldn't play moving into Mexico. You know, you kind of get what you pay for and you got to have a good provider. And, and uh, like you said, rolling inventory costs money. So if it's sitting around and not in a manufacturing place in, in Mexico. So definitely can appreciate the fact that uh, you dif- have to have your, your ducks in a row before you just send a shipment to the border. Yes, yes. Uh, obviously, like we say, the, the most expensive product is the one that you don't have at the plant. So uh, that, that's the main objective. And, and like you mentioned, yes, sometimes they do, they do quote, they do an RFQ or an RFP for, and they might go with the cheapest price. But sometimes that's not, it's not always a necess, it's not necessarily the best solution. It's understanding the business. That's what we focus quite a bit about understanding, getting to know what you're doing, how you're doing it. And all these years of expertise, that, that's what we want to add. We, we, we think that nowadays, crossing the border, anyone perhaps can cross it now. Brokerage, there's quite a bit of brokers doing it. It's how you do it that differentiates one from the other. And then bringing in other aspects that weren't traditionally into the Mexican custom brokerage, such as technology, uh, bringing all that on board, that, that's where you start to differentiate one from the other now. Uh, brokerage, not that it has become secondhand, but it has become secondhand in, in the sense that, that now it's, what, what, can you, what else can I do for you guys? What, what, what can I do? How can I do it? How can I make your life easier? How can I let you do your business and concentrate on your, on your expertise? If you do face masks in Guadalajara, concentrate on how you do them. Don't worry about how the product gets there. That's what we're here for. That's, that's our job. And for you guys to concentrate because Many times they, they worry about, well, where, where's the product? Where is it? Where's it stuck at the border? And that's exactly what we don't want you, the client, to feel. Obviously, right. complying with everything and for them to feel, hey, if it's now or it's five years from now, any audit from Mexican authorities, we feel good. We feel good. All the paperwork has been filed correctly. Everything is in order. We have our product here. And that's what we want to do. Excellent. We're here today with Fernando Noriega with BTS Group, and we're learning about uh, uncovering the the mystery of border crossing. Um, Fernando, one thing that uh, everybody likes is visibility. It's like, hey, I can manage issues as long as I kind of know what's going on and and, and have visibility to where my product is physically. That leads into technology, right, and and some things that are coming down the pipe with uh, how you manage technology. So talk a little bit about that, whether that's kind of provided by the carrier, whether that visibility is provided by, you know, the broker, things of that nature. So talk about technology in 2020 um, to give visibility to customers as their product moves north and south. Yes, well, no, I think that you, you when I started uh, talking a little bit about my background, as you saw, we're, 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 we, we're very heavy in the IT, in, in IT. Uh, we definitely hit our sweet spot there. And as freight forwarders, and even as freight forwarders or, and or Mexican brokers, um, that's our sweet spot. Uh, I would say that is our sweet spot. I think that technology became a game changer. And uh, we were fortunate or I was fortunate enough for my father actually to be kind of pioneer in that, in bringing in IT in a Mexican custom broker or freight forwarding world where it was usually not talked about. It was like everything was done old school, maybe more manual. My father started to bring in when Novell was the first network that sort of came out into market. He brought an IT developer, an IT software guy on board and say, hey, let's start to incorporate this in a week, I think. So he had great vision. I, 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 I think that my father was pioneering that in Mexican brokerage. And that has continued. And that's what we saw when we were younger. And you may say uh, information systems in your when I did the university in the master's, in, it was IT. It was IT and it was, my father was always like, well, well, well the brokerage part and the freight forwarder you can learn as we go along right here, but bring in IT, the more IT, 
And I think that nowadays you say 2020, it's definitely that's, that's, it's allowed us to do everything much better. Uh, visibility wise, status wise, everything is real time. Clients are now more and more used to seeing their stuff on their phones, on their iPads. So it's how, how can you do it? it? But even taking it a step further, it's allowed all the key, all the key players that I described to you before in, in, in the process to work hand in hand. For example, suppliers now are, are, before they used to fax you an invoice, which we would have to manually input, causing time delay or delays at the border. Now with technology, you're able to, in, to do, create and develop interfaces with them where they can send you files via all sorts of way now. Um, so it's through that that you're able to do, to, to, to avoid that manual input. Um, importers and exporters of record, now you can share your databases with them as well. And for example, I'll give you a good example. You may have uh, that, that company in Guadalajara, it may have had a huge uh, department with a huge head, head count manually inputting information from Mexican entry forms. But now you can do interface from our system and our databases with them, and it has allowed them to reduce their headcount, reducing their costs, but at the same time, keeping the data integrity. That's, uh, that's huge. That integrity is huge, especially when you're dealing with customs. So that, that's a huge must. I would say that it's also the technology 2020 has allowed you to, to add value, to add value, to add value to all that world of information. There's just so much information now out there from suppliers, from the broker, from our traffic department, from transportation, for the importer and uh, Mexican importer of record. So now it's what can you do? What can you do? Well, how, how can I make that information valuable to you? Uh, how much duties are you paying? How much value added tax are you paying? What HTS codes are you using? Why are, why are you paying duties? Is it because you didn't apply a certain um, uh, certificate where you could get preferential rates, et cetera? So it allows you, now it's allowing you to make decisions with information instead of having to worry about where your where shipping is. And that's kind of like the neat part. Um, it's allowed us as freight forwarders and Mexican brokers to work also hand in hand with Mexican customs. Uh, as you were mentioning, the, the way duties get paid through technology, uh, you validate your Mexican entry forms, you pay your Mexican entry forms auto, in an autom with automated tools. And that's, that's how it, I mean, it's been huge. It's been huge. Um, it's been a game changer, it, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Data is power, right? And the more data you have at your fingertips, uh, the more informed you're going to be and the more successful you're going to be as a as an importer or, or selling goods into Mexico. So um, at nine years old, you were driving a forklift and we just talked <laughs> no, no, about... <laughs> not that little. Maybe, no, that okay. was like four, four, maybe that was like 15. My father okay. was pretty strict with it there. So. All right. Just six years, <laughs> plus or minus. Um, so we started there and then we talked about some of the technology out there in, in, in 2020. Where do you see things five years out, right? So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, maybe take it a little bit, little bit uh, sooner, say three to five years out. What, what do you see changing... Um, or different at that time to make it smoother or better visibility or to make an overall um, more efficient process for the uh, importer or exporter? Yes, well, I think that uh, the um, I, it's tech not technology. Technology five years from now, I think it continues to, it's, it's just moving so, so fast and so many tools are becoming available uh, at a very, very fast rate. And I think that Mexican customs are also on board with that as well. And I see five years from now, much more automation as far as customs is concerned, and less paperwork, trying to create a, a seamless border in that sense. Not that you won't need a Mexican broker, I think that you, you, you will need it, but it's the level of automation, the level of automation, much more, much more integrated, everyone working hand in hand. Um, just technology and the tools that continue to come out. I mean, there's RFID still waiting to be fully explored in, in, in this particular, uh, in what we do. It, it, it is it is there, but I think it's just, we're just barely touching the surface with it so far. There's artificial intelligence as well. Uh, I think that that's going to possibly come into play. Uh, so there, there, there's quite a bit. That's where I see everything moving, continue to move. 
uh, obviously there's there's the political the the, the 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 new NAFTA, which is now the U.S. MCA agreement, was renewed if you want if you to call it something. So that that was extremely positive as well. Right? We continue to see uh, continued growth and trade between the two countries. Uh, through and and through and through automation, I think that that's the key now. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, let, we always like to end with with some positive and and uh, maybe a couple of nuggets of, of information and and advice, I should say. So, there was you know one or two thing, one or two um, things or pieces of advice you would give to our uh, to our listeners and our audience to say if you're going to be importing into Mexico, here are one or two things that are absolutely critical to have a successful border clearance. What would you say those are? Yep, I think that pre- preparation, prepare as much as possible. Uh, that, that would be the, the main one in the sense that run through the whole process with, with your service partner and make sure you have everything set up correctly. Uh, for example, be, make sure that you're correctly set up as a Mexican importer and or exporter of record, that everything is in place there. Make sure that the main document, your 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 in your your invoices, uh, your certificates, your anything that any permits, any paperwork, that you have everything at least knowledge of beforehand. Uh, like I mentioned, once you hit the border, it's it, not that it's too late, but you can do it. Preparation. If you prepare, everything will run much much smoothly. I think that uh, another thing, another important thing, is to get to know the uh, the process, the flow. Uh, much like we did right now, and, and obviously at, at a much slower pace and in much more detail, but perhaps make a trip down to the border, get to know how everything works, how the trailer will ar- arrive, how we as freight forwarders will do an audit, how we're going to document, how we're going to to validate that your documentation is correct. Come see all the checks and balances that we have within our process, what processes we have, what controls we have. And that will give you great visibility, especially uh, when, when you know what's going on, where, the, where, where it's actually flowing. And I guess finally, it would be trust your service provider. Trust, trust your service provider. Open up. Let them know what you're doing, how you're doing it. Uh, the more you, you allow them to be able to understand what you're doing, uh, the better I think it will turn out uh, for, for everyone involved. If we, if we know we can recommend, hey, why don't we do it like this? Why don't we do it like that? This can save you here. This can save you there. We can do this. We can do that. And the more you can open up, that I think that would be, it's always way, way better. Yeah. Those are good, good final thoughts. You know, like you said, um, uh, an ounce of preparation is worth a pound of cure, so to speak. So I appreciate you sharing that with our audience. So sure. Fernando, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. I, I think you, you touched on the USMCA. That's a whole nother, whole nother discussion <laughs> that we can get into. Yes. So we, we may have to have you back a little bit on that one, but, um, I'd also like to thank our audience for joining us today on Uptime Logistics. Of course, it's powered by Cap Logistics, and you can find more information about the show in the description below. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to, uh, to our channel, and please visit caplogistics.com. And uh, I want to thank, uh, thank everybody for joining us today.